This is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Before we get into today's program, I just wanted to mention that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more podcasts and articles about politics, religion, media, and society, and how they all intersect and impact each other. And if you want to get directly to the archives of this program, just go to theoryofchange.show. You can get the full video, audio, and transcript of all of the episodes. And if you're a paid subscriber, thank you very much for your subscription. That is really helpful. And if you can't afford to subscribe right now, I understand that, uh, but you can help out nonetheless if you just leave us a nice written review. It can be just like a sentence telling everybody on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever about how you like the show. And if you're on YouTube, please do subscribe and click the notification button as well. That's helpful. All right. So uh, with that little plug out of the way, let's get into today's program. Automotive industry is in a state of turmoil right now as a number of manufacturers, particularly Ford, have scaled back the production of both vehicles and battery technology. But nonetheless, all of the companies have said that they will be continuing to move toward an all-electric strategy, which makes sense. But the last part of that response is something you certainly don't hear about in the right-wing media coverage of these developments. But then there is, of course, another interesting and bizarre development in the electric vehicle industry, and that is the political radicalization of Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, who has gone from being a proponent of clean energy technology and somebody who was widely respected in the industry to somebody who is a full-scale right-wing lunatic. What does that mean for the future of Tesla? What does it mean for the electric vehicle industry? And have governments themselves also made mistakes in terms of what policies they have implemented in order to facilitate the transition to clean energy vehicles, something that must be done in order to protect Earth's environment from climate change. There's a lot to unpack with all of these developments, and so I wanted to bring in a friend of mine named David Roberts, who writes a newsletter called Volts, which focuses on electric vehicles and other environmentally friendly products and services and regulations uh, that we're going to need to have to really create a holistic solution to our climate change problems. And also, David is a former writer over at Box, but now he is exclusively writing over at Volts. And now joining me today is David Roberts. Welcome to Theory of Change, David. Hey, man. How's it going? Good. Well, so the uh, car industry, it is really in turmoil right now. They uh, they have made a lot of mistakes uh, with it regard to electric vehicles. And, you know, it, there's there's a lot to talk about in all this. Um, I guess let's maybe start with the right wing basically is giddy, I think, with all this news uh, of manufacturers <laughs> scaling back uh, their production, uh, you know, whether it's Ford or especially Ford. Um, and I mean, what what went wrong first? There's a lot that went wrong. Let's let's uh, go with some highlights here. <laughs> Sure. I would I would just like to start with a broad point, though, and this will be the, th the theme today, which is EVs are inevitable. They're taking over. In any large scale transition like this, especially as it's just getting going, there are all sorts of short term bumps and, um, you know, side paths and 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 mistakes and fluctuations and that's what we're going through right right now and, and and they're interesting to talk about but this is all like five years from now 10 years from now we'll look back at the conservative giddiness about all this and just roll our eyes like it's like it's like saying, oh, you know, DVDs are a fad or, oh, cell phones are, are a fad because like one cell phone manufacturer, you know, lost money one year. <laughs> it's just, it's all, it's all silly. These things are all going to iron themselves out in short order and EVs are going to take over. That's, that's, that's the big picture point I would make. Um, yeah. The, 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 the smaller picture point is, and, and, and it's, you know, how much of this is is automakers screwing up and how much of it is just like the situation they were stuck in you know it, it, it is debatable because right now we're in a situation where you know because of this loophole in our fuel efficiency laws which i'm sure most people are familiar with at this point which basically gives 
light trucks, i.e. SUVs, uh, and out a different a different economy standard, a fuel economy standard. So, you know, automakers started making more and more SUVs because they could sell them for more and make more money. They make more money on big cars than they do on little ones. <laughs> and they didn't have to make their big cars efficient like they had to make their little cars efficient. And so they've just been making more and more big SUVs. And then, of course, like, if the market is flooded with big SUVs and all the advertising is about big SUVs and all the deals and, and discounts are on big SUVs, people are going to start buying big SUVs. And then like the people who don't buy big SUVs are going to start getting nervous because they're surrounded by big SUVs. So they're going to buy big SUVs. And then you're going to have a bunch of people come along, <laughs> come along and say, Oh, look, Americans love big SUVs. It's just in their character. It's just in their, it's just in our national character that we love this. You know, this is, this is, mm -hmm. this is a, a goofy bit of economic analysis that we do in lots of areas. Like it's like sprawl and, and single family homes and, and, and sprawling suburbs. It's the, it's the only thing we're building. It's the only thing available. And so that's what people buy and then we conclude from the fact that people buy them, oh, this is what people want. It's just in our national character that this is what we want. No, it's just all that's out there. Anyway, so so yeah. right now, like Ford and GM, the big uh, uh, U.S. automakers, are making money hand over fist on giant SUVs. <laughs> and that's... And, and medium-sized ones as well. <laughs> and Don't forget those. Medium and large <laughs> SUVs in there, and, they're, and they've been writing that... that high on the hog you know, for, for several years now. So they are understandably loath to give that up. Um, and so what they've been trying to do is, you know, just make giant EV SUVs, make giant high-end expensive EV SUVs. And, and, you know, I think, um, I get the exact number. Something like right around thirty-five thousand dollars is 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 the sort of midway point that cuts. That's about fifty percent of the market is below that. About fifty percent of the auto market is above that. And everything that's been made, er, almost without exception, except for like the leaf and the bolt, basically, are above that threshold. So half the market's been locked out. So that's a mistake. And then, um, and, you know, and also we're just in sort of an awkward period, like Ford only has two EV models to speak of, the Mach-E, which isn't really taking off, and then the, the, the Ford F-150, which was supposed to be a big deal, but has run into supply chain issues and cost issues and ended up costing a lot more than they thought it would, and so it's not selling as fast as they thought it would, and they're just in the midst of working on a bunch of new models so they're in a sort of awkward pivot point right now. GM yeah. is on, GM is in an awkward pivot point because right now their most their most popular um, EV is the Bolt. People love the Bolt. I have a Bolt. I love it. And that's just the little hatchback. It's like the only little hatchback EV available. So people are buying it, buying it. They tried to. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying right now to shift to a new battery platform called called Ultium. That's going to be a much better battery with much better range and all their new EVs are going to be built on that platform. The Bolt is built on the old platform. They tried to shut Bolt production down so they could pivot and focus on okay. this new battery. And then everybody got super pissed. And like, there was like a revolt, yeah. popular revolt. The only thing that was affordable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so they've been forced to keep making the Bolt, but anyway, like they're awkwardly in the midst of pivoting and just putting together new models. You know what I mean? It's just like a weird time in the market. Whereas like, I think people should like pull the lens back, look at like in China, you know, their, their, their EV manufacturers are offering like 30 to 50 different models and there mm -hmm. are chargers every couple of blocks. And it's just like, it's just the idea. And that they're standardized. Also. And they're in there and they're standardized and there are lots and lots of low cost models. Like there are models at every, at every sort of point price along point. the, uh, at every price point. So we're just in, 
we're on our training wheels now and our big automakers are scrambling to catch up. And this, and this is like Toyota's big mistake too. Toyota for some reason clung to the dream of hydrogen <laughs> cars for way longer than is sane or rational. I mean, people have been pounding the table trying to tell them hydrogen cars are going nowhere for literally decades um but they clung and clung and now they've kind of let that go now they're frantically trying to pivot to evs and their latest their latest line is well it's going to be plug-in evs are going to be the big thing and they're still sort of resisting full battery electric i think that will last another year or two they will see which they will see how things are going and they'll scramble and catch up. So sort of like all, all the big, my, my point is all the big U.S. automakers are for for a lot of sort of idiosyncratic reasons in a strange moment of pivoting right now. And that's why you see all these fluctuations. That's why you see, um, you know, certain models getting dialed back, other models in development. And so and, and Tesla, too, um, you know, Tesla dominating dominates this market and has been but they only have five models and they really only have two mass market models um and they're and the uh, platforms for them are pretty old um and they're like four four or five years old yeah so they are Mm -hmm. also frantically working on a a, a low-end mass market you know thirty five thousand dollar or under car which was originally what the s was supposed to be because <laughs> if you remember yeah, they they're said really going to do it they're really going to um, do it this time it's really important for them that they do it this time because if they don't because right now all these big chinese automakers are staying out of the u.s market because they don't qualify for these big tax breaks that we've implemented and 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 there are giant tariffs <laughs> on them like we're doing everything we can to keep them out but if like yeah. 2026 comes and Tesla has not come out with a mass market model yet. And no other automaker has yet either. I wouldn't be surprised if BYD or some other big Chinese automaker doesn't start selling low end SUV or low end uh, EVs in the U S market. Yeah. Well, and just to step back to a a point you made kind of at the beginning there, um, you know, one of the, the things that you often hear opponents or like fossil fuel proponents say in regards to fuel you know what uh, in regards to cars is that they they claim that they want a free market and but the reality is the united states with its electric vehicle policy is not a free market because again like these these you get special benefits if you make an suv you're exempt from from the 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 higher more stringent cave standards and so it's not a free market it is actually a market that deliberately well maybe not deliberately but at this point it's deliberate uh because nobody's changed it but at this point the market subsidizes and encourages suvs um so it's not a free market but they don't I mean, they never they never admit that. <laughs> there is no there is no market of national significance that is free. <laughs> I mean yeah. there's no yeah. such there is no such thing. The entire yeah. auto market, I mean even beyond all the regulations and subsidies and 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 gifts that these, you know, like these the automakers if they if they want to site a battery factory in your town these towns and states are giving them like breaks on taxes, billions of dollars in subsidies to cite things, different places. Like it's just like regulations and subsidies from top to bottom. And that is inevitable. There's no way around it. So we have the market that we created, right? We have the market that we designed and we designed a market for large SUVs and that's what they're making their money on. And now, and, and even beyond the internal sort of subsidies and, and regulations in the market itself, there's infrastructure. Like we built infrastructure around and for certain kinds of vehicles, you know, and now we need a new infrastructure and the free market is not going to create infrastructure. That's not yeah. what it does. Oh, and like, it never you know, did in the first place. Like it the, never the, did. We, the, 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 the highway the freeway system. Yeah. The gas, the stations, freeway system. <laughs> gas stations are hugely subsidized. Like the, it's all, I mean, it's, 
it's all designed and we designed it and, and you know and, and and what happens is you design a market you end up with certain um incumbents <laughs> with power in that market mm-hmm. and then they fight changes and that's what's been going on that's why we're late to the ev game in the first place that's why we're yeah. sort of slowly stumblingly pivoting in that direction is because they are riding this cash cow of large suvs and they do not want to let it go so that's the tension we're we're, we're seeing but yeah there's no uh, no free market anywhere in this vicinity oh and in any country for that matter and you know <laughs> in any country I mean, in it, any large market yeah um yeah it's right and so it's and, and it's an it's a point that i do think gets lost a lot in sort of kind of the you know economist type articles uh you know from the economist magazine um that you know they it, there's just this it's just this fiction and elaborate fiction and everybody just assumes that the current conditions were natural and they weren't we we made well, these things is, we did this this is on purpose. this is not, <laughs> this is not unique to the car this is not unique to the car no. market right like what happens yeah. is powerful people set up systems to their benefit and then it's also to their benefit to pretend that the system they set up descended from heaven or grew it's out of organic. the earth yeah. it's just natural and organic the way things work like any powerful incumbent is going to say yeah. that like i i i use the 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 uh, uh coal industry as a as an uh, illustrative example of this so like coal has been subsidized up and down the wazoo from the time it was discovered in this country mines were yeah. were subsidized production subsidized consumption was subsidized and, and 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 coal was on top for a long time, and then when other cheap and 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 coal and even the healthcare of the employees also let's point yes, that out. and they would fight uh-huh. off any attempt to regulate or change the inter- energy industry by saying we believe in the free market. The free market should decide. We shouldn't pick mm-hmm. winners and losers, right? Like once you've yeah. been picked as the winner, you have every <laughs> to come out and say, ah, no more picking winners and losers. Let's just leave it here, you know. And then the minute cheaper alternatives came along and started out competing coal all of a sudden the the free market rhetoric vanished and it became about mm-hmm. heritage and the hard workers that we have to protect and they need subsidies mm-hmm. and they just came with their tin cup banging for more subsidies no one truly supports free markets uh, the 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 the, yeah. the, the the idea of free markets is a disguise that incumbents use to 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 obscure their privileges. It's just what I would say, and that's what's going on in energy. It's what's going on in EVs. But the and 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 the flip, I think people need to make. I think the sort of popular impression of this is you have a market, a free market, just shaped by consumer demand, and then along come the lefties and the climate people that w- and the do-gooders that want to come mm-hmm. interfere in this market and pick winners and losers and distort, that's the word, right? Distort the market yeah. with their preferences. But that's not what's going on. Right now, you've got, and this is true in energy and it's true in EVs, right now you've got products that are better and cheaper <laughs> on a life on a lifetime basis than mm-hmm. the ones they're competing competing against, and the reason they're not the reason they're having trouble is because the incumbents are so heavily subsidized and protected. It's not do-gooders coming along trying to insert inferior products in a great market. It's inferior products being protected by mm-hmm. incumbency, by power, by regulations, by subsidies against better products coming along, and that's true in electricity too you know it's true in uh it's true in home heating like in, in a bunch of these areas um where there's a, the clean energy fights going on it's better products coming along trying to break into markets that are very well protected where incumbents are very well protected and that's very true in the car market too yeah well at, at, now at the same time i mean there are, it is interesting also just to step a little bit further back in the history of, of electric vehicles that um, you know, when they were first w- being explored as an as a consumer product, um, the initial electric vehicles were very small and were, you know, they were trying to be as affordable as possible. 
Um, and as a result, they did develop a, a bad reputation. Among well, that was people for being by necessity. slow and small. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and they were doing what they had to do because that was the technology that was available. Um, but nonetheless, like, so when Tesla came along and, and, and uh, of course, as everybody, I think, who is watching or listening knows, it was not Elon Musk's idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we have to say that. Um, that went, no, um, that what, what they did, though, was that it did that idea did bring a different orientation to the electric vehicle market, which was to say that which was to acknowledge the fact that when you have in, a, a engine that can generate instant torque, that can uh, use much, d develop much higher horsepower for the weight distribution, et cetera, more equal distribution, that those are things that are useful and great in a sports car uh, and a performance vehicle. And so like yeah, it did kind of reorient to things, uh, but, uh, and, and they kind of reoriented it too far, I feel like, which to your point, like they, <laughs> they, they completely got out. Almost everybody got out of the low end uh, electrical, the affordable electric vehicle market and was like, well, no, we're going to make a supercar with a thousand horsepower. And they all decided that. <laughs> yes, and now yeah, they wonder yeah. why they have problems getting into the truly big market of sales. I mean, I give all praise to Tesla for, for what they did, which is precisely what you say. Dem and this is not I mean, this is just because battery technology got better and better, right? I mean, the, the 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 early EVs. I mean, the early EVs were like in the 1900s, like 1910. Like there was a big. There's some fascinating history. There's sort of a one of these sliding doors moments at the very beginning of the 20th century where electric cars were competing against gas cars, and 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 it's funny. You go back and read. You go back and read about that debate, and it's almost the same debate. Like the advantages of electric mm -hmm. cars were the same then that they are now. They're cleaner, they're less loud, you know, they're more uh, reliable. But it was just range. Batteries weren't good enough, and ultimately that plus a lot of again subsidies, etc. And so gas cars won. And so when EVs came back, you know, sort of like the '90s or whatever. It was, again, with very sort of underpowered batteries. And so you made these small cars that didn't go very far, didn't go very fast. So what Tesla did yeah. really is just take the improvements in battery technology, which have been lately rapid and mind-blowing, and just show... U.S. consumers like no, you can you can do you can do this with <laughs> you can do this with batteries now. You can go really really fast. You can go really really far with batteries. But as you say, I think a lot of people took the long long wrong lesson, which is like oh, like there's this huge market in high end luxury EVs. Let's yeah. all herd into that because that's where we can make our money. Because it's hard to make. Yeah that you make more money on a big SUV. You don't make as much money with small electric cars. Like they're better for- Or, or a smaller you know, ice car for that. Better for like you know. <laughs> they're better for everyone uh, except the car companies. So yeah. um, so you, you need pressure to make them. But yeah, like we're rapidly, I mean, again, again, I, I emphasize over and over again, we're in a weird, awkward, early, we're like preteens in this in this market, so there's a lot of sort of awkward stuff <laughs> that's going on that's going to work itself out. Like in short order, EVs will be able to go farther than gas cars. That's not that's not far away. That's less than five years away. And then range is gone, right? And then charging is is very difficult, and we're doing it poorly here in the US relative to Norway or, or or China or other markets but that's like the the market the market logic of all these EVs you know profusing all over the place is going to drive charging and in 5 years like that's mostly going to have settled itself you know what i mean like this oh, this stuff is short term the range the range worries mm -hmm. are short term the charging worries are short term. The, oh my God, it doesn't work in the cold. Like all that stuff, all this stuff is going to look silly within five years. We're going to figure it. The, the batteries are getting better and better. They're, Toyota is about to, says they're coming out with a solid state battery that goes much farther, has much better range than existing batteries. So all like the range issues are going to disappear. The charging worries are going to disappear. And all of these sort of like, the idea that these are, deal breakers or some sort of substantial barrier in the in the way of this market is just mm -hmm. silly like 
it, they, the market has overcome these barriers in other parts of the world and can easily mm-hmm. do so here. Too. It's just a matter of time. So, you know, a lot of these, yeah. a lot of this is just noise, short term noise. I you know, I just want to emphasize that over and over again. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and the, re, you know, kind of rejection of these, you know, high end electrical vehicles, that actually is a free market response. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because outside of this country where the manufacturers make and present smaller electric vehicles to consumers, they buy them. <laughs> and yes, and I mean, so imagine that. Insofar as I can't afford it is like a free market decision. Yeah, I don't have enough money. It's, it's a, that's a free market decision. Yeah, like I yeah. I mean, I, we could barely afford our, our, our Bolt, you know, but, but in China, like, again, like, I just encourage people to read a few articles or go watch a few videos about the kinds and range of EVs available in China. It's not just that there's all different sizes of cars and all different sort of focuses of cars is that the technology they're putting in the cars, like the cool thing about an EV is it's like an iPhone on, on, on wheels. Right. And so it gets updated with new features the same way your iPhone does. Like this is something Tesla is doing already. Like the big updates in Tesla's are mostly over the air, over Wi-Fi. It's mostly the sort of internal technology of the screen. And, and so the stuff they're doing in Chinese, cars with with stereo systems and voice recognition and all the different screens and technologies they're just like way ahead of us like really cool stuff is coming that people have not seen in cars before like right now we're just sort of like i think to the average american an ev is just a normal car right it's just a car you drive and it looks and basically operates like any other car but the the technological possibilities inside an ev are unlimited and we're just scratching the surface of, of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. And me, but I do want to talk about hybrids though, in this context, um, because, you know, the other thing, so I, I, I don't agree with Toyota's, um, you know, hydrogen fascination, but at the <laughs> same time, it up. I think they've finally let go. Yeah, of the ghost, I think they seem to be. Yeah. Well, um, but, in terms of, of hybrids, I think that they do have a point, especially in, in particular markets that are, are rural uh, in country is, or in countries that have very little electrification period. Um, like there's a, there, I think they're right about that for some, for some markets to, to say that, you know, EVs cannot always be the answer, but of course they need to be in the long term. But right now, you know, this is, this is, they shouldn't be criticized. I think, for, for, for saying, look, right. hybrids are okay for some circumstances here. Well, let's distinguish here. There are hybrids like the original Prius, and mm-hmm. then there are plug-in hybrids. Yeah, plug-in yeah. hybrids, I think, are, are, are going to be big and are big in other countries. Like we've seen in the last couple of years, sales numbers on, on what they call PHEVs, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, those numbers are starting to go up and it, and it is, and it is, I think ultimately a temporary solution, right? It's a gap filler. <clears throat> this is a car that will go all electric for <clears throat> a certain number of miles, <clears throat> excuse me, and then flip over to, to gas. And that's, and given that like 95% of, of car trips are three miles or less, despite yeah. what people despite what people seem to think the vast majority <laughs> of, 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 of car trips are, are short and can be done all electric. And then you have the gas engine in there for your longer, or, or like if you're rural or whatever. So it is a good gap filler and it is, I think yeah. going to be big. Just the question is how long, right? So if, if you're an automaker, how long is this gap going to exist? How long will it be before EVs, and EV infrastructures are so ubiquitous that you just don't need this gap filler anymore. Is that going to be three years, five years, 10 years? Like, you know, swinging your production line around and designing several new models of car is no small thing. Yeah. Takes no small thing. So, so it's, so it's, it's just a big, it's all, 
like this is true in so many areas of clean energy. It's not a matter of what's going to happen. It's just a matter of speed. It's just a matter of how long do you think it's going to take? And that can make a very big difference in your short-term investment strategies and your short-term success as a business. Like those are, these are not small, small things. Like societally, yeah. long-term, it's clear where we're going. But in these short-term fluctuations, yeah. Like So I think there is a big market for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles like like uh we you know we're considering one we have a uh we have a a second vehicle that's on its last legs and we have a, an EV and 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 yeah we'd like a car that is capable of going on long road trips in the in the EV charging infrastructure especially you know once you get in the interior of the country some areas mm-hmm. it's not is not holding up yet so you know we we've thought about it but 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 you know, I would just emphasize this is not a resting place. Like PHEVs no. are not where we're going to end up. It's just a matter of bridging here to there, and and so there will definitely be some successful PHEV models, and they're already taking off. And again, again, we have like in the U.S. like two or three like our our choice of PHEVs, our choice of plug-in hybrids is so sad compared to what they already have in China. Like in China, there are make, they are making plug-in hybrid electrics that will go almost 100 miles on pure oh, electric God. before they before they switch over, which is like 99% of your, uh, uh, of everybody's, you know, so it literally just has the gas engine in there as like, as, as, as a backup. So there, you know, there's already way better plug-in hybrids available in other places and those will get here eventually. Yeah. And one of the other uh, infrastructure things, and we talked about a little bit, is the, you know, the idea of the charging station. Um, And this is yet another example of of American political leaders failing to understand, you know, take understand how things work in the rest of the world. And, you know, like in the United States, um, and this is this was so I will I will bring in the comparison of cell phones here that, you know, for the longest time, Apple had their lightning standard for phone plugs and tablets and lightning sucks. It's a terrible standard. It it delivers lower voltage. It's slower from a data perspective. The plugs are less durable. It sucks, but they were continued to allow to make it. uh, And they were only making it just as a way to force Apple customers to buy Apple products and make it more costly to you yep. to leave their ecosystem. And, and charging like and, 35 bucks for replacement lightning yes, cables. <laughs> yes, for worse, a worse product. Um, and so, you know, the, the European Commission, they finally got tired of that. And they said, look, everybody, if you want to sell a cell phone or a tablet in our, you know, in our governing area, you're going to have to use USB-C as your connector. And... And, you know, Apple and, and their, you know, apologists and fanboys and girls, you know, they, they said this was horrible in the end of the world. Apple couldn't possibly do this, couldn't possibly use USB-C. This was wrong. It was, you know, communism. And then, you know, when the law came out and flipped over, Apple said, OK, yeah, we're going to we're going to do it. Already they're on. To <laughs> Already they're on to complaining something else is communism now. And, and, and nobody's, <laughs> nobody's thinking twice about lightning cables. And, and, and that's the cycle of life. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing is like big economies making big transitions. Plan. They need to plan. <laughs> they need to do things on purpose. They need to figure out where are we going and what's the most rational way to get where we're going. We just don't do that here. We pretend like we have a free market. We pretend like we don't plan. So our planning ends up being ad hoc, reactive, Hmm. shoveled through the tax code. So it's opaque and nobody knows Hmm. how it friggin' works. You know, we just do planning poorly. And so we stumble and back our way into these things. Like, yes, the entire transition to EVs could be a lot smoother if there were some sort of national plan. And if there were some sort of like, you know, planning about where, what parts of the country are best, you know, where should we start with EV infrastructure? What highways should we start with? You know, we just need to do some planning, but we don't, we don't do that. So we're just sort of, 
you know, blindfolded hacking our way into the future. We'll get there eventually, but mm -hmm. it would all be more sensible if we had some sort of national plan for how to switch over from gas stations to, to EV chargers. I mean, another, the, the backside of this problem, the, fr the front side is how do you get enough EV chargers, enough places that even people who can't plug in at home, right? This is the big, the big dilemma. Yeah. People who can't plug in at home have enough charging around them available at work or wherever that they can manage without it. That's the front end. The back end is as you're switching over to 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 P plug-in hybrids and then eventually to to EVs, the the amount of gas cars in the road is going to eventually start shrinking, and it's in all the high-end consumers, all the wealthy people are going to have nice new EVs and it's going to be poor people left with the gas cars. And then as there are fewer and fewer gas cars, gas stations are going to start disappearing. And so what do you do to avoid the situation of the country's poorest people being stuck with cars that they can't find fuel for? How do you dial mm -hmm. down gas station infrastructure in a rational way, in a just way that isn't just a mess of inequality and, 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 you know, sort of like who gets caught holding the bag. Nobody's even really talking about that yet, but again, it would be nice mm -hmm. to have some sort of plan or guidelines or at least rules or at least some, like if we could just, just discuss openly nationally, this is going to happen. Here's how we'd like to see it done here's the way we could do it where the fewest people would suffer we just don't mm -hmm. do that so, so yeah you know so gas well, stations are going to be an interesting phenomenon in like five to ten years yeah and i will say um you know it at least uh with regard to the charging standards um and actually i'm sorry can you hear a uh, a uh, motor outside at all on, very on my vague. audio very very, very vague. okay like I okay. wouldn't have noticed. I um, wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't said. Okay, let me let me just make sure my noise reduction is turned on here. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, I I'll I'll try to cancel that out. Um. So. Okay. So, but just uh, with regard to the uh, electric charging standards, um, you know, it is still the case that there is no government mandate for um, charging standards and there needs to be. Um, and I mean, it, fortunately though, at least Tesla did finally open up their standard as a, uh, uh, as a thing that yeah. other manufacturers could yeah, use. Tesla's like, dominance is kind of forcing the issue. It's, it's everybody yeah. has, the, you know, like that's what the other automakers are like, fine, we have no choice. Like these are the, you know, they brought their such total market dominance that mm -hmm. they effectively were able to force you know, their charging standard on everyone else, which is fine. We need, you're right. We need a good one and it doesn't matter yeah. that much which one it is. Yeah. Well, and you know, and, and, and th these are things that, that again are inevitable and part of that planning that you're talking about, because uh, it, when any new technology is in the process of becoming pervasive, standardization is a requirement for, full penetration, full establishment. And that was yeah. true with railroads. That was true with, you know, uh, railroad gauges. That's true with electrical plugs for just for normal use and just internet, I mean, a variety of things. Yeah, the internet, exactly. We had, to standardize, um, and, we had to standardize IP addresses. Like that's what enabled the internet work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, and, and the reality is sometimes, you know, these private organizations can get that job done, but sometimes the government has to put their hand on the scale because, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, proprietary systems are advantageous to the proprietors. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And so, but they're not, you know, it, it, a monopoly is not a free market either. And so <laughs> if you want competition, you have to have open standards. Uh, and you have and, 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 you know, so at least we're finally, you know, everybody seems to have adopted it, at least in the, in uh, North America, uh, the Tesla SAE J3400 plug. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I used my first level three charger the other day. First time, first time ever. I got a level two installed, you know, when we got our car, but I've never actually stopped. I've charged at home. So I've never actually stopped mm -hmm. on the highway. So I had to stop on the highway for the first time ever the other day and, and plug into a level three. And it's, you know, easy peasy, smooth, 
took me 10 minutes. Yeah. I peed, got a cup, I peed, got a cup of coffee and I had, you know, whatever, a hundred miles enough to get, I get home. It's already, you know, it's already on the verge of easy enough, especially in yeah. some, in some places, but yeah, we're good. I mean, we'll standardize over time and, and, um, and, and, and charging will come along and charging will get more powerful and faster and we'll get batteries that are able to charge faster. Like they're already talking about these like one and two megawatt chargers that can like zap mm-hmm. you up in 10 full, a full charge in 10 minutes. Like that's, you know, those things are huge draws on the grid. So. And that's into- what it, uh, uh, yeah. What do you repurpose the gas stations for <laughs> you with those? Like any new gas station constructed will have to have, two charging ports. That's like, yeah, I, I think, think that's that how will be standard. Do. That will be standard. But, but what I wonder is like, as gas stations go away, maybe this is just like a Gen X thing, but like convenience stores in gas stations are, 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 are this weird thing in America that are, they're so ubiquitous and so much a part of my life. Like so many of my memories rotate around them, even though they are manifestly, Kind of ugly <laughs> and unpleasant. You know? <laughs> they never, Overpriced. they've never been pretty. <laughs> there are no nice ones. You know, they're all very like utilitarian, but they're so familiar and so you know, like so many movie scenes. Just like so much of our culture revolves around gas stations and convenience stores. I wonder what's gonna like. Are they just gonna vanish? And you know what I mean? This will be something well, where think, our yeah, kids high power know. chargers. That's what you do with them, man. That's a, that's what I think you turn them into. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know if the placement like geographically is going to be right. And we're certainly not, I don't think we're going to need as many as we have gas stations. I don't know. I, I just find that whole, I'm so yeah. curious to see how that plays out. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. So um, I guess one of the other things though, that, you know, we got to talk about it. Who the the person who is the elephant in the room in electric vehicles, and that is <laughs> Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> um, you know, he he really has gone from somebody who was widely respected in in the industry and in, among environmental advocates to somebody who you know actively is consorting and funding and boosting. You know, some of the people who oppose his entire business. Um, that's really what this guy is doing. Um, and I, you know, I honestly, I have to wonder how much, how can he even stay? Like, can't, will well, he be forced out? Do you think? What what's interesting is made to shut I mean, up. <laughs> <laughs> we've all been watching his, you know, which I think is a very familiar arc, right? Yeah. It's, there's nothing particularly unique about the arc he's been on. Like yeah. people getting red pilled right in front of us. It's a familiar, you know, it's a pretty familiar yeah. dynamic at this point. But the question is like the end of the road of that, the end of that red pill road is climate change is a hoax and fossil fuels rule, right? And and so he's getting swept along so quickly and he's started saying not quite that, but like things in the vicinity of that. So I'm wondering if he's going to get so red pilled, he's going to end up in opposition to his own <laughs> business. And I would that like, I would not be surprised at all. It would not, I mean, he came out the other day and said, all we need to do on climate change is a carbon tax. Right. So and this is a very familiar sort of conservative oh, line, yeah. like all your regulations yeah. and subsidies and standards are just market distortions. And all you need is a, a carbon tax. But if, the, if that were true, if all we had ever done is a carbon tax, Tesla would not exist. Tesla is a creature of subsidies. It is a pure creature right. of, of, of U.S. government subsidies. It would not exist without the loan program's office. It would not exist without a deliberate effort on the part of U.S. policymakers to accelerate the EV space. So it's it's wild to, to sort of just on a sociological level, a psychological level to see it how far he'll get red pilled and whether he'll end up (laughs) opposing himself, (laughs) whether he'll end up trying to tear down his own business because he's gotten so far up Joe Rogan's ass. I I mean, (laughs) and I'm, I don't know the question of like, is him being an extremely public a-hole going to hurt Tesla's sales 
is interesting. I, I go I, I go back and forth. I don't know that it really has yet. Like there are bigger forces that that Tesla's gonna like I said, like they need to make this mass market car. They need to nail that. The the, the cyber truck is just a absolutely embarrassing, ridiculous waste of time. self-own waste of time, ridiculous. So if they don't get that mass market vehicle right, then they're kind of screwed. And I think that's gotten you know little to do with public opinion of, of Elon Musk's tweets. But but yeah, it's a I mean it's a remarkable thing to it's a remarkable thing to watch. Yeah. Well, and and related to that, very much so, is a, a, a legal judgment that was recently rendered um, in favor of the uh, environmental scientist Michael E. Mann uh, against two right-wing columnists um, for slander. And this is something that he kept out for 12 years and uh, has... Uh, is it's incredible that he he stuck at it, um, uh, but he, he won and uh, w- against uh, two w- guys, w- uh, yeah, and against uh, Rand Sin- Sinberg, who was a uh, writer at uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute, a libertarian sort of uh, junk science place, uh, and then uh, against uh, another guy named Mark Stein, who, um, I guess. Not don't see much of him nowadays, but he was a Rush Limbaugh substitute host, and he wrote something at National Re- Review, um, and basically, yeah, sl- it compared compared Michael Mann to a child molester, um, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and called him. I, and I'm actually, I'm sorry, I don't remember which one called him fra- a fraud or a child molester. So people can look that up. <laughs> yeah, and they accused him of, of fabricating data. I mean. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 funny, the funny thing about this is just just narrowing your view just to climate stuff. Mm-hmm. The right wing from Limbaugh on has been right wing media has been nothing but a giant cascading torrent of lies and slander. That's all it's been. This is like like you go mm-hmm. yep. you could go throw a rock at the internet. 10 years ago and hit slander. Like it was constant and unending and still is constant and unending. And I just think it's, I just think it's, there's something funny and sort of quixotic about, about Michael Mann being such a cussed, stubborn guy that he's like, I, at least in this one instance, at least these one, you know, these guys, I am not letting this go. I am I am going to pursue this until there's some accountability and this goes to show you like any one of that massive cascade of lies and slander trying to get some accountability for it is a 12 year you know ordeal and like that dude has been through a lot he's been subject to a lot of 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 harassment and the mm-hmm. all the usual threats and stuff from the right and it's been financially difficult and like, it was not easy for him. Like he really had to pursue this. And that just goes to show you like the massive asymmetry here, the massive, massive asymmetry, just like lie and lie and slander all, you know, like a thousand times a day. And any one of those trying to get anyone, any third party authority to come in and say definitively, yes, this was a lie and slander takes 12 yeah. damn years so like it's just like it's just such a massive asymmetry it's it's sort of disheartening you know like i'm glad he won but it's just like it's such a pebble in a it's such a pebble in a waterfall you know what i mean yeah well and um and actually i, I had a previous episode for people who are watching or listening um, about how the tobacco industry kind of pioneered a lot of the tactics of disinformation that were later put to use um, on climate change and and later on COVID um, as well. And uh, I mean, like, the and this is yet another example, though, of how, you know, a lot of times, you know, people will on, on the right or they're because there, there are so many people out there who call themselves moderates, but who are actually conservative. Um, and they're very, very overrepresented among elite national media editors i would say <laughs> they're conservative they're not moderate um and but what I call, they I like they have this reactionary centrists that's the that's the yeah. the, the term word yeah yeah well 
And but the thing about them is that they 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 fetishize this idea, you know, of of free markets. So they have they call it the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and they they say that anything is up for debate. But the reality is these people, you know, who are out there committing slander routinely, you know, saying some so and so is a pedophile or, you know, a fraud or, you know, whatever slander they're they're doing, um, those are that's not how a real life marketplace works. It's like, <laughs> have you guys ever been to a farmer's market? Like you have to have a permit to be there. You have to like people inspect your products. Like people and you know, people are allowed to return things to you if they don't like it. Like these are all rules that are imposed on your free market, your marketplace of ideas. All markets have to have rules, otherwise they cannot function. And the same thing is true with regard to information markets, that if everything is up for debate, then nothing is up for reality. Then there is no reality because I can no. literally say, you know, you can literally, you know, I mean, we got people now that are saying the earth is flat and that, you know, the moon landings were fake and, you know, all this stuff that you would think that we wouldn't have to talk about this shit uh, and that, you know, people that are doing fact check websites wouldn't have to waste their time with it, but they sure. are. Poor souls, poor souls. It's amazing. Those fact checks haven't, haven't worked yet. They, they keep fact checking the same stuff over and over again. <laughs> when is that going to stick? I mean, here's what I would say. Go back and read your Milton Friedman's, your Hayek's, your whatever, your Adam Smith's, and read about the characteristics of a free market, what it takes to create a free market. Part of that is ease of entry and exit, right? You have to be able to get into the market. You can't be excluded from the market by non-market forces, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have a, a gang of billionaires who is taking <laughs> your entry into the marketplace of ideas and putting millions of dollars behind it and buying up the largest cable network in the country and buying up all the local newspapers and buying up all the local TV stations and buying effing Twitter and pumping your lie through all those channels and excluding other voices, you by definition do not have any kind of free market. Those are market distortions. Those are monopolies. Yeah. Those are, you know, these is like, it's a classic, classic market distortion. Like the reason those idiot yeah. ideas still are circulating and still have to be fact-checked over and over and over again is not that they're succeeding on their merit. It's that they've no. got a bunch of malign right-wing billionaires pumping money behind them, forcing it out yeah. into the public again and again and again and again. That's why they're still out there. Like yeah. I, I, at, at this point, like they are as refuted as refuted could be. All the conventional mechanisms for assessing ideas have been brought to bear. Like this question is settled. Yeah. If there were anything like a referee of any kind left, they would have stepped in and said, and blown the whistle and said, yeah, this is over. Like TKO, you guys are done. Mm -hmm. Let's move yeah. on but there. But, but they have very deliberately for decades now destroyed anything like referees, slandered referees, tried to, claim that every referee is actually secretly biased for the left. I mean, mm -hmm. this was Limbaugh's thing, right? He's like government, yeah. the academy, science, all of it is just the media. leftists. Yeah. The media, it's all just secretly leftists. So anything that looks like a third party referee who's ruling against you, you don't have to trouble your brain about that. You don't have to trouble yourself. Yeah. That's just it's a lie. Weapon. Trying to, it's just another. The only person you can really trust is me, and they've succeeded mm -hmm. in doing that. So there is not. There's just. There's no mechanism now for ending any debate. There's no mechanism now for anyone winning. There's no mechanism now to settle. Yes, mm -hmm. this is true. Let's move on. So you can like you can throw out like, oh, it's cold today. So much for global warming, and then some mm -hmm. poor intern will put together a you know. A beautiful, you know, presentation or video about why that's nonsense, and and everybody will watch the video and be like, oh, that's nonsense. And then a year later, they'll come out and say it again. Like you can't stop them <laughs> from saying it. There's no, there's no one now. There's no, there's no mechanism for settling things, and so things just go on forever. Arguments just go on forever. This is why. I mean, 
I'm, I, I know at this point I'm very much preaching to the choir, but like, this is what they learned from Watergate, right? They're like, oh, like, like it looked like a partisan back and forth, but then this sort of set of institutions and hearings and officialdom stepped in and officially settled that it actually happened and imposed some accountability and settled the thing, right? <laughs> like, like yeah. they called it. And so this is what the right wing learned from that is like, we got to get rid of those, not, not let's stop lying and cheating, but we got to get rid of those referees. We got to get rid of anything that looks like a third party referee that could, that could, that could vote against us. And they started with media. They, we just have to create our mm -hmm. own media. And that's what the whole thing spun out of. And so now like yeah. you can have Trump take documents openly steal documents, say he's stealing them, say he wants them, you know, just like you have all them the, back. Yeah. <laughs> all the facts laid out in front of you as clear as day, but no one can come in and just say, oh, that's settled, that's wrong, you know, here's here's your accountability. There's like nothing left that can do that. So we just can't settle anything now. And everything looks like an endless partisan back and forth scrum and that is what they want that is what the tobacco people wanted yep. that's what the anti-climate people want they don't want to convince the public that they're right they yeah. because like what would that mean they're right like anti-climate people have like 50 different dumbass talking points that don't fit with mm -hmm. one another. Like climate change isn't happening. It's happening, but it's not bad. It's happening, but it's not caused by humans. Like what are they supposed to be right about? They're not. Or they're it's not good. To, they even say that. Yeah, or it's good. <laughs> they're not trying to convince them that they're right. They're just trying to create the impression that this is just a big, yeah. nasty, endless grinding fight that you moderately engaged average voter just don't want to mess with like you just don't want to think about yeah. it you want to like you want to get away from that let's just make it unpleasant so that people just don't want to deal with it and that's what's happened on climate it's not that they've convinced people that climate that climate denialism is true they've just made the entire subject so viscerally unpleasant that people don't want to engage or think about it at all like that's that's the success yeah, yeah well and ultimately i think that's the takeaway you know, that I, that I want people to have is that, you know, their goal is to get you to give up. It's to get you yeah. to walk away. Yes. It is, you know, as Steve Bannon said, to flood the zone with shit. Um, and ultimately they, they're, they're not trying to win through persuasion. They're trying to win through perseverance, but two can play at that game and they should. <laughs> well, can they like, are there other Michael Manns out there? Like he's he's such the rare exception. Yeah. This is such the rare exception to well, see. That's why I said should. <laughs> like, like at this point, the only really institutions like this has been my my experience of the Trump years. It's just like one institution after another, just incredibly disappointing. Just failed to failed to stand up. Failed like when their time came, they failed miserably. And like pretty much the only institution left that is imposing any kind of accountability or establishing any clear factual record is the judiciary is the is the courts like they're the only ones now restraining trump and the right which is why the federalist society exists it's precisely why they are going directly after the judiciary because it's the last referee standing and they want all referees gone and that's what that's what filling the judiciary with hacks like Eileen Cannon is all about mm -hmm. is just to make, yeah. make the legal arena, just like everything else, a vicious, endless, ambiguous scrum that no one wants to deal with. They want to make it, you know, so that to me is the, is it's kind of like the last fight. This the last it's, the, it's, it's like a, we've retreated and retreated and that's like the last institution standing. So i you know, I wish people would, and, and, and they've taken over the Supreme court and they're busy, like undoing a century's worth of laws and they're enabling Trump and already like the court is half gone. I just like, to me, if the court goes, that's, you know, if courts become thoroughly corrupted like this and become thoroughly partisan, that's kind of it. Like, 
there's nothing left. The media is completely yeah. capitulated. The, the, the academy is is got its tail between its legs, is in, in, in full retreat, uh, as you can see all around you. Like science, you know, like there's just nothing. There's almost nothing left to stand up to the tide of uh, of BS, reactionary BS. Sorry, this is yeah. not a very not a very uh, uh, optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, on. yeah, I mean, I will say though, like if you look at polls of younger Republicans, at least on when you regards to climate change, they actually. Um, do believe that it's real, um, and they do believe that humans are causing it. So I, I, I'm so and, curious about that. I'd love to interview. I just love to interview some of them. Like, what do they mean by that? Like, if you take what the IPCC s says seriously, mm -hmm. what they say is, if we want to keep a safe atmosphere, a safe operating space for human beings. We need to stop emitting greenhouse gases. We need to get to zero as rapidly as possible, which involves revolutionary, rapid change directed by governments. And if you don't, so what does it mean? What does conservative believe in climate change mean? Like, how do young conservatives propose to get to zero emissions as rapidly as possible? If they don't believe in government, I, I'm genuinely curious and baffled yeah. by that whole phenomenon. I don't. Yeah. Well, no, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I think to some extent, you know, you look at early Ron DeSantis, uh, his gubernator, his governor term, his first term. You know, he actually had some pro environment policies. So, like, I don't know what's. You know, well, I don't know what the future holds for these guys, because, you know, having been a former Republican, you know, you're constantly and it, who has any sort of heterodox viewpoints, you're constantly afraid of being canceled. Like that's the yeah. the, the biggest thing no one ever talks about is that Republicans love canceling people. And they invented it. In fact, <laughs> I mean, it's not like like right wingers, fundamentalists, reactionaries impose uniformity okay. this is not a <laughs> this is not some unique thing to the present moment this is like a yeah. this is like a, a, a truth of history going back to you know going back centuries like the whole idea that the left which is literally pushing more choice more diversity more freedom for more kinds of people mm -hmm. like this weird funhouse mirror image that they're the ones trying to be tyrannical is such a bizarre it's bizarre to me that it persists like of course right wingers want everyone to think the same way that's sort of what it is to be a right winger like you want a male white christian landowning hegemony yeah. like that's and that's one kind of thing that's a monoculture that's what the, that's what fundamentalists everywhere want is a monoculture this idea that it was ever anything else is bizarre yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and I think overall, I mean, the, the demographics are not destiny, but, you know, there's a reason that the right wing is freaking out so much is that, you know, because uh, I know because I like, I'll tell you, you know, I, in that. Huh? I well, used to no, like, I, for instance. Yeah. Well, but it only happens, though, if you make it like the future belongs to the people who make it. And so there are trends that exist that are both positive and negative for either side of the spectrum, but the, but they can't become real unless they are made to happen. And yes. so like, that's, and, that, and that's my message to the Democrats is you guys have to understand yes. that, you know, you can't alienate your voters. You can't forever force a choice between the lesser of two evils. You have to give people things that are good. And if you do, <laughs> they will well, like you. <laughs> well, it's, Will they? Because Biden came in and like engineered the greatest economic recovery f of any country in the world and, and sparked a manufacturing renaissance precisely in those areas of the country that were hurt by globalization. Like he did a bunch of he did a bunch of good mm -hmm. things and doesn't seem to have gotten fuck all political credit for it like right. it's not clear to me that no one knows that he did it though that's the yes thing. That's, this is the thing is the media you know i hate I, I harp on it over and over again to the point that people make fun of me but like 
objective circumstances are not driving <laughs> what's going on in this country. Like people don't know what Biden is or has done because the media is a grossly distorting filter. And so they only get negative, they only get negative news about Biden. And, and, and I just like think, you know, to anybody who thinks that some, that there's some magical other candidate that could come in at this point that the media oh, would yeah. not find some, you know, like they found Probably. her emails, they found his age, they would find something about Kamala Harris they would find something about Pete Buttigieg and you'd get the same dynamic. It's a structural dynamic. It's not unique to Biden. It's just what I would say. And the the final thing is anybody who takes comfort in the idea that demographics are slowly going to crush the right, I would just say that like reactionary movements that are responding to their own perceived inevitable obsolescence have created some of the worst historical crimes in history. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a cornered yeah. shrinking movement is extremely dangerous. Like it's maximally dangerous at the moment when it's maximally in peril. So, yeah. you know, it, it, like, you know, I, I just think people need to, people need to um, uh, boost their tragic imagination about what could happen <laughs> in the next few years. I really think people do not appreciate how off the rails things could go when the sort of white male Christian establishment is in a panic about its, about its, its reducing power and influence. They could make lots of really bad things yeah. Happen. We should not feel any sense of comfort that like demographics are slowly but surely going against them. Yeah. That's precisely yeah. when they're the most dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. And and people yeah, people need to keep in mind what's at stake and what could happen because yeah, the there is no bottom for the reaction. <laughs> right. like, I mean, I mean, uh Trump's out there joking about the kind of shit that would that would literally start a world war. Like it sounds fantastical to even talk about it, but like the idea of a of a world war breaking out of a nuclear exchange, like all of that is on the table if he wins. No, no tragedy is off the table if he wins. I just don't know if people are really if that's really sunk in. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, I guess we can only do what we can do, right? We can only uh, pot at the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I got I got clouds in the background here on our video feed. So there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, David, uh, it's been a great conversation. So people can keep up with you on social platforms at Dr. Volts. That's D R Volts if you're listening. And then over on Volts.wtf. So yes. thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, Matt. All right. So that is the program for today. I appreciate everybody for joining us for the conversation. And if you want to get more, you can go to theoryofchange.show where you can get the video, audio, and transcript of all the episodes. And if you're a paid subscribing member, thank you very much for your support. You are making this show possible. And then please do also visit us at flux.community. Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more podcasts and articles about politics, religion, media, philosophy, and technology, and how they all intersect. And I thank you very much for those who are signed up. You can support us that way. And if you are able to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or somewhere else, that's very helpful as well. And I appreciate everybody for that. And uh, if you want to subscribe on Patreon, we have an option for that if you are not a fan of Substack. So I appreciate everybody who is helping out. And uh, we're going to spread the good word together. Thanks very much. I'll see you next time.